going to invite Hein de Haas and Jolie Mabundu to come and sit on stage with me. And I'm briefly going to introduce the both of you. <laughs> Hein de Haas is a sociologist and geographer. He is currently professor of sociology at the Amsterdam Institute for Social Research. And his research focuses on long-term trends, causes and impacts of international migration in origin and destination societies. And in 2023, his book, How Migration Really Works, a factual, factual guide to the most divisive issue in politics was published. And he talks about 22 myths of migration that we need to well, understand and that needs to change in order for us to understand human mobility. And we're not going to dive into all 22 of them, but I hope we can address quite a few of them. Jolie Mabundu is a Belgian actress who became known by her main role in the film by the Dardenne brothers, Tori and Lokita, the name of the film, which won a special prize in honor of the Cannes 57th anniversary. And in 2023, well, we just saw it, you played a role in the green border. Thank you both very much for being here. Hein, I want to start with you because you had not seen the movie till a couple of hours ago. You do huge work on migration, but then it's always, I think, mostly about statistics. How is it to see this film for you? Well, I also go to the field and that's I go true, to the I know. <laughs> but of course, to see this from this close, no, I don't see that normally. So no. I think it is incredibly important. And uh, particularly because it's really difficult to make a proper documentary about these things because authorities don't want us to see these things. So I think this sort of form of art and is a great way to express what it means. What I quite find powerful is that it also looks at the issue from different angles. For instance, also showing how difficult it is for border guards. Mm -hmm. In the United States, I've spoken to border guards who had to separate families under the Trump presidency. And then you realize these are just normal people, often from quite poor families that do a job. We're also fathers and mothers and, and are confronted doing that work. So you could say that politicians, who we rightly criticize for these kind of policies, pushbacks, not just happening in the Polish-Belarusian border, but all across the Mediterranean, yeah. uh, are outsourcing that work also to workers who are the border guards. And there's often also this dichotomous view, you know, the border guard versus the migrant, the good versus the bad. Mm -hmm. But in many ways, you could say that the border guards are also victims yeah. <laughs> because they have to do the dirty job, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and politicians push people to do these jobs. Of course, you have more responsibility as well as a border guard. And I think that was also shown in the film very powerful and how that also creates some of course, for many reasons, the suffering of the refugees is centerpiece and for a good reason, but this really does to human beings and the dehumanization is so clear. But I think that you, it shows the whole complexity of the different actors and I think this, this is what makes the movie powerful. It's not just a story of bad versus good. No. <coughs> Jolie, for you, do you, can you take us back to when you first read the scripts? So uh, when I first received the script, I was uh, still in Belgium mm -hmm. and the, the script was written in Polish. So it was then translated to French for me or uh, I think even no to, to English. Mm -hmm. And at first I, I didn't really understand anything because uh, the, the translation was directly made. And so I was like, wow, this is intense. And I was trying to dive into it, which was actually quite easy because it was very well written. But um, at the same time, I think it was one of the first uh, scripts that I read where I couldn't really imagine how it was going to be portrayed, mm -hmm. but I was like only looking forward to it and and the proof because I accepted and I play in the movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, but I was really like just uh, impressed by how they wanted to like, uh, portray the movie after reading it. And even while shooting the movie, I was still dis discovering certain aspects. Uh, for example, the fact that the movie was going to be in black and white, I didn't yeah. even knew it when I was reading the script. And so I was like, uh, at each day on set, I was like, wow, okay, oh, wow. 
was like, oh, vrai, wow. <laughs> so I was really like impressed the whole time. I was still discovering things and learning things, not only about the subject, but also about how uh, she wanted to portray it. And even mm -hmm. watching the movie, how uh, she did it in four phases, so four point of views, was really just, I think, immaculate. Mm -hmm. And for you to know that this was all based on real stories, real mm -hmm. testimonies, but does that change the way I act? Yes, or I think in my acting as an actress, it doesn't change anything because even fictional characters are, tend to always consider them being uh, beings actually, mm -hmm. and to portray them as best as I can, and to consider them and not to only like fake it and try to act, but really just to be. And especially for uh, uh, stories and movies where I portray a real human being or where I represent a real human being, I think there's still an extra uh, feeling of trying to honor the person and or the soul of the mm -hmm. person. So I think, yeah, there's the little, uh, a little like pressure or something like that, but uh, I think it doesn't really change whether it's a fictional or a real character. I was wondering for the both of you, because what we spoke about also in dealing with this matter as a sort of a, a surgeon, a surgeon, mm -hmm. so you keep in a way your distance also, not getting into it too much. Is that something that you do as well, hey, that you sort of try not to get the personal stories too much to you? I think the personal stories are incredibly important to understand what, what it means to people. But I think if you enter the political arena and the debate, you have to be stoic. Yes? Yes. Why? Because the politicians that invent those policies, are, they, sh they portray bully behavior, basically. Mm -hmm. If you're in a debate and you want to control a bit the facts, because you know this word migration crisis. Mm -hmm. Everybody assumes there is a migration crisis. That's a political crisis. Refugee numbers are not as high as people think. On the longer term, they haven't increased. In fact, in the late 1940s, when, which was the time when the Refugee Convention was created, in the aftermath of the Second World War, the absolute number of refugees in the world was way higher than now on a much smaller world population. Let's not forget that. And refugees all around the world is 0.3% of the world population. Now that, that goes up and down a little bit, and if you, yeah, if you live near to a country where war breaks out, like Ukraine, yeah. you've got in a particular region, Europe, an increase in refugees. But even in Europe, it's not that unprecedented. So politicians have constructed this image that Europe is besieged by a wave of people coming in, fleeing war, climate change, inequality, and it ties into this very stereotypical image of the rest of the world, let's say of Africa or the Middle East. And they're all coming in big masses. And everybody has constructed this image. It doesn't actually square with evidence. So now people have the idea that through images, you know what's happening on the, on the Polish border, what's happening on the Mediterranean border, that this is all about illegal migration, or regular migration, people crossing borders. Well, there is a certain percentage of migrants in, in Europe, but it's not as big as people think. And um, so I think it is really important to, in a way, if you discuss these things with those politicians, mm -hmm in a way to dismantle the whole idea that we have a migration crisis in terms of Europe being invaded. Mm -hmm. Because that has always been the justification under those policies. And this is how Europe is going towards its moral bankruptcy, by lowering those fundamental norms where a value community like the European Union should be standing for. And the only way to totally control your border is construct a totalitarian regime. Yes. And that's the past we're coming from, right? Yeah. Anyway, I don't know whether that's a good answer to your question. No, absolutely. But, but I think if you enter a debate, you, you should understand how we're being manipulated. Mm -hmm. What I find very interesting, what you say, and I think you were also here, present in the Bali one day during an election debate, where we invited you to be someone who was sort of ringing a bell every time something unfactual was being said, and you had to do that, well, a little more often than I think is good. But how... Uh, maybe it's a big it's a big question and it's also two questions in one. But how did the facts disappear from the public debate regarding this topic, and how do you get them back? By stepping beyond this pro anti frame, which is so stupid about migration. Uh, migration is there, has always been there. We know that mm -hmm. most migrants, by the way, don't come to flee war. That's a tiny percentage. It's mostly about people finding work and things like that. 
um, yeah, I think it's to break through the current polarization. Because I, I found it interesting you refer to that debate with major politicians. Mm -hmm. I got both left and right wing politicians angry. Yes. Because the left and the right is buying into a whole, and actually the left is copying what the right's been doing about immigration. So the new UK government who's coming in has the same talk about, about immigration, stop the boats, the same mm -hmm. narrative. And this goes back to not 2014, 1991. That's the start of the so-called migration crisis, because that's the year that the European Union introduced Schengen visa that meant that, for instance, North Africans and people from Turkey no longer could come to Europe without passports, uh, without, without visas. And that's when the smuggling industry started. Because it is not smugglers who cause all of this, they provide a service to migrants who want to cross borders. We have created this whole crisis in Europe, and it's been going on for the last 33 years. Mm -hmm. And it reached a point of insanity, and I think what it does to people is also very important. So these kind of movies are so important. At the same time, there is a risk, I see, let's say, to end up in this doom and gloom image of the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, the world is so full of problems, that's why I have so many refugees. And unfortunately, even refugee organizations contribute to that imagery. So we get in a doom and gloom scenario, because if we all start saying, there's simply too many refugees, you actually undercut the support for this, for, to, to receive and help refugees. And the Ukrainian case, of course, we, you already talked about it, uh, totally proves that it's not about numbers. It's not about numbers. <laughs> it's about political will, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, and now the numbers game is being used to say, well, we have more and more refugees, we simply can't deal with it anymore. We have to shut the border, which means you abuse human rights on the border. And that has made, been, been made very clear. I think these facts have to come through mm -hmm. very clearly. Jolie, I think you noticed how intense this debate has gotten when you were there for the premiere for the film and all the threats that came <laughs> after the film. Can you tell me a bit about what you noticed and what that was like? I think um, I realized it was actually really serious when we were shooting. And it was, uh, I think, me and some other actors and my twin brother in the car coming back from a shooting day. And I think then we knew that uh, I think Agnieszka had to do some press release or a statement because there were also like leakages of images of us shooting the movie yes. and stuff. And so uh, just by hearing, I was like, oh, is that serious? Because I, I didn't even had the knowledge about what was really happening, how serious it was, how uh, political it was, and and because I only knew the knowledge that I had from the first movie that of I course. made that yeah. was a similar uh, topic, but I, this was like from another point of view and from a, a whole other situation. And, and we were really like into it. And then afterwards it was when we did the premiere at the New York Film Festival and where uh, Agnieszka was uh, kind of protected. And so the movie received a lot of backlash from uh, political figures and just uh, government officials in, in Poland. And, and so it was kind of crazy because it, it's really dangerous and they, they were like, kind of literally just hating on what Agnieszka was doing and on her and, and saying awful things. And so it was all over the media, but at the same time, the movie was really also praised. So mm -hmm. they did a little, as Agnieszka said, a promotion for the movie. And, and a lot of people went to see the movie. And so, yeah. What kind of reactions did you get to it from the people in the, yeah, your friends and your family and... Um, I didn't really get any reaction from uh, my close entourage, from my family or from my friends, but more for, it, there was like a huge solidarity between the cast members and the team members and even the activists with whom we were, uh, with, with whom we stayed in touch. Mm -hmm. And so we were all just together, mm -hmm. actually. So. You're, you're still in touch with them? Yeah. Yeah, That's even good. with the, uh, like, a, a big part of the whole crew, uh, I saw them last week, and uh, another part just on social media, and even with the activists, one of the activists contacted me, uh, I think 
of two months ago uh, to talk about the situation who's still going on and not going for the better. And so it was really touching and frustrating at the same time mm -hmm. how, uh, because we were involved in the project and so we were kind of all, we knew about the whole situation. We didn't live it because we will never be in a similar situation. We just were representing some people and things that are happening because it, those are facts and realities, sad realities, and just knowing that it's still happening can be quite like getting emotional and frustrating. Of course. Yeah. Hein, maybe talking about that and the, 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 con the, the continuity of it and also what Jody is saying that is still going on at this border, when there's a scene in the film where the woman from Afghanistan, she knows very well that this moment she has to cross the border, she has to say, I want asylum. And they also come with the forms, which is beautiful and also heartbreaking, I think. Um, because it's, but that's the law. That's, the, the, that's what we in Europe said, that is the, the way it should go. So I was wondering, what can you, as a as an EU, what can you do against this? I mean, should there be sanctions against Poland? Is that any way useful? How to deal with this? Well, if you want to hold the European Union together, we need some common standards in Europe. But it is it is true that there is a lack of responsibility sharing within Europe in terms of refugees, mm -hmm. and that has been the issue for the last. <laughs> 30 years already, mm -hmm. where Southern European, Eastern European countries where, you know, most people enter, you talk about refugees and, and undocumented migrants. Uh, of course, they, you have this Dublin system, it, it is not working because they say we don't get enough support from Northern European states. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so-called solutions on the national level don't help anything. For instance, extreme right-wing politicians are very uh, proud of Orban, but Orban basically does, if you want to talk about a responsibility or yes. a burden, you shift it towards other countries. Yeah. Or Denmark is very proud of the refugee mm. policy. Well, since Denmark got so strict, more refugees came to Germany and the Netherlands, so it's not solving any problem. No. It's basically shifting people around and increasing their suffering. So when politicians, you know, always show this moral outrage, right, when migrants die on the border, but it's completely hypocritical because it is the same policies have created this whole situation. So, you know, this, this language of, you know, we have to crack down on the smugglers, we have to, you know, that kind of language mm -hmm. doesn't acknowledge that why do we have smuggling? Because refugees or people who actually look for work and know there's work and their work's being tolerated even if you don't have papers, know that crossing borders, yeah, they have good reasons to cross borders, either to flee oppression, violence, or indeed to, to find jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and then you hire a smuggler. So how could ever that policy solve the problem because the policy has actually created a problem? Mm -hmm. And this is how you get polit politicians angry. I've seen this also in a debate here in the Bali where both the Labour and the right-wing Liberal politician mm -hmm. got, got mad with me because I told them I don't believe politicians really want to solve this problem. because. Populist politicians have an interest, what I call the border theater, to continue. If Why? there's no overcrowded asylum seekers, if there's no suffering on the border, because that imagery helps to sustain this image of there's simply too much uh, poverty and, and, and misery in the world, we simply cannot deal with it, we have to close the border. And unfortunately, I also see a lot of force on the left buy into the same image. It's all about refugees, the world is on fire, more and more people are coming, which is not true. But that continues this idea, we have this theater on the border. And it, this sounds very paradoxical that, you know, the bigger the outcry that's happening on the border, the bigger the case can be made, or we have to do something about it because there's simply too many people coming. You get the point? So mm -hmm. the more we pay it, and that is the moral dilemma, I think, it is very good that, you know, these kind of very good documentaries or films are being made. The dilemma I see, the more we pay attention we pay to that, we may ourselves inflate almost the size of that movement in the first place. 
I can give you one statistic. Nine out of 10 Africans comes to, that moves to Europe comes legally. Many people are shocked when I say that because the image has got so distorted that it also seems about boats or people crossing, sneaking yes. across borders illegally. Or oh, this is partly refugees. <coughs> and like I already said, those numbers are not mm -hmm. that huge that we couldn't deal with it. And the Ukrainian case, in a way, has proven it. So yeah, I really think we need to step beyond that. Mm -hmm. That whole bigger doom and gloom frame that more and more people are coming to Europe, more and more refugees are coming to Europe. This border crisis, this migration crisis, how everybody adopts the term migration crisis. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there is a migration crisis, that's a political crisis, mm -hmm. because Europe can't get its act together in terms of sharing that responsibility. That is the real crisis. With this attention, because you're also really um, critical of journalism and the way journalists now in the Netherlands are dealing with this subject. For instance, we have so here have the conversation about the uh, asylum law crisis. So basically, that the government wants to implement a crisis law to get out of certain European legislation, if I'm saying it correctly. Um, if not, please uh, do it better. Um, and this has become a huge topic in the papers. Do you think, is it, is it too big? Should it be yeah, different? I think it's too big. Uh, and that's the dilemma I was talking about. So what is happening is that we have leading politicians from the, the, the far-right PVV party mm -hmm. that just, just float all these ideas, like we need a state of emergency in the Netherlands so we can deal with the asylum crisis. Although numbers of asylum seekers in the Netherlands is not an unprecedented high at all. The only way thing that could justify a state of emergency is like a natural disaster or if there's suddenly one million people appearing on the border or something like that. Nothing of that. And so, and now this new idea about uh, the Dutch Uganda plan, you know, to, to send uh, mm -hmm. asylum seekers who were rejected to Uganda. It's the Dutch variant on the Rwanda plan. Without ev even, there hasn't been even one meeting with Ugandan government about this. So they just throw this in the political arena. Everybody jumps on it. Oh, we have a migration crisis, an asylum crisis. So you perpetuate that image of we, the, it seems like in the Netherlands right now that most problems are, are the result of asylum migration. Mm -hmm. Whether you talk about lack of housing, problems in healthcare, yeah. crime, everything is caused by asylum seekers basically. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's a relatively small group, it's about 10% of all people coming to the Netherlands. Yeah. We could easily deal with that. And the same for Europe in a bigger scale. So this is a crisis that's being created by politicians. And Agnieszka, of, uh, Agnieszka Agnieszka Holland also Holland, said yeah. that rightly that it's this fear and I don't think it is a coincidence that since it is since the fall of the Berlin Wall mm -hmm. because before the Berlin Wall the main dynamics were the Cold War right the, the scaremongering the fear of nuclear war the so-called communist enemy and the other I'm sure the capitalist enemy on the other side that sort of dominated the political scene and that was the main lever for, for fear mongering for politicians the war on illegal migration was declared pretty much straight after the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Politicians need an enemy. If there's no real, real enemy, you invent one. And this big enemy that's being invented is the migration thing. Mm -hmm. So migration becomes this ultimate problem we're facing, totally inflating the size of migration and, of course, the impacts of migration. So it's a, it's a huge problem, but I also think that we are so much part of that frame of migration as a problem to be fixed although it cannot be fixed, it's there, we have to deal with it. And that is a reality that politicians are not willing to face, but I also think indeed uh, the, the, the whole media circus, particularly on television, is just feeding that animal, that beast, all the time by taking too seriously all those proposals of which we already know they're bound to fill. Mm -hmm. What is this like in Belgium? <laughs> yeah. Would you say it's the same? Immigration? The, the way the political debate is now really only focused about it, on it. I think um, I was, I felt that it was more current, for example, when I did the, the last movie with the Brothers Darden, who's uh, talking about a similar subject about immigration. Um, but 
I think, yeah, in Belgium, it's also like a very common subject, a very common problem, but not only in Belgium, I think everywhere. We, we, we can even talk about like Italy mm-hmm. or, uh, or Spain. And, um, but I, I felt it more... Uh, like for example, one year ago, but for example, even if you go to Brussels and you go to the North Station, mm-hmm. you'll just see it. Mm-hmm. They, it, it. They don't have to talk about it, you just have to see it just in front of you that there, there's a, a certain situation and that people just don't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe for you both, uh Last question before I'm turning to the audience. Hein, um, you also propose that there is a, a different narrative and a different story that we need if we want to move out of it. So what, in a short, if you look at the, the future to get out, what can we as Europe do? To deal with this? No, to, yes, to, well, to, <laughs> maybe not to, to escape, well, to escape this, story, because you do propose that there's a different way in which we can deal and speak about migration in your book. Yeah, we, start, we should stop talking in doom and gloom terms about migration. That is actually something that the left and the right have in common, mm-hmm. interestingly enough. Their solu- so-called solutions are different. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 this goes beyond this movie, but more the of general course. theme of the, the external border of the European Union. Um, so there is this image that's now being created, you know, that we talked about that Europe is being besieged by a mounting wave of illegal migration, mm-hmm. basically, or refugees, and this is all because of poverty, inequality, better infrastructure, climate change, wars, violence. Mm-hmm. So we create this image of doom and gloom around Europe. I'm not denying the fact that there are some horrible wars going on, but unfortunately, that's not something new. Mm-hmm. We've always seen in, in the post-war history peaks and valleys in refugee flows depending on where conflicts would occur. But we don't face an unprecedented wave of refugee migration or migration in general. It's simply not true. Um, and you see both the left and the right bought into this narrative. Now, in the left you hear different solutions like, oh, we need to decrease poverty and inequality in the world, then we have less of those people coming here on the right. It's even more border closures, perhaps, Mm -hmm. although the left also has a lot of similar proposals. But anyway, the underlying image is a very negative one. Of migration is a problem we need to fix. Mm -hmm. We need to fix development problems so people wouldn't migrate. We need to not have violence so people wouldn't migrate, although we just know that most people migrate because they can find better work and circumstances. And it's not the poorest of the pe- poorest to migrate, it's actually people from middle income countries because migration is an investment. And the biggest victims of climate change and, and other you know, things to come are the people can't move in the first place. Mm-hmm. So all these images you know, of the waves to come, you find it on both sides of the spectrum. We need to go beyond that. And that is not a pro-migration narrative because that's also problematic. We really have to try to understand migration as it is. And it is a horrible cliche, migration is of all times. I, but I think we need to take it really seriously in the terms of people have always migrated, people will always migrate. Mm-hmm. What politicians do is selling illusions, a lot of wishful thinking, and if there's problems, they look away. They don't solve problems. So I think what we need is a new generation of leaders, <laughs> opinion leaders, intellectuals, p- journalists, and politicians who understand that this same old story may attract 20, 30 percent of the vote, but many people are highly uncomfortable with a narrative where politicians no longer dare to show empathy with migrants, Mm -hmm. no longer dare to tell a story about migration that is neither totally positive, neither totally negative, but doesn't use migration as a scaremongering instrument. Because even climate activists do that, when they say, well, if we don't address climate change, hundreds of millions of people will come to Europe, which is a factual uh, um, uh, error. It doesn't Mm -hmm. work that way. But you see it on all sides of the spectrum. So we need to get rid of migration as this ultimate fear-mongering instrument. Mm -hmm. We need to understand migration as it is, as part of who we've always been. And that doesn't mean you can't do anything about it, but it means you accept it. Mm-hmm. And as, as long as we create an illusion, you can totally seal off the European external border, it's not going to work. So we need a new story about migration. Some people have valid concerns about immigration, I understand that. If you live in a neighborhood where lots of migrants concentrate and you don't see many economic benefits of migration, 
people have good reasons to ask what's in it for me. It doesn't mean that immigration has caused all these problems, but it's just uh, some people benefited more from it than others. That's something else to be acknowledged. But for refugees, it's clearly a lack of solidarity. Yeah. So if European nations got their act together and do some level of responsibility sharing, for instance, I talked not about burden sharing, but responsibility sharing, it's also the language you use. It is a problem if suddenly 100,000 people arrive at the border for those border communities, of course. Of course. But then you need yeah. solidarity yeah. within countries and between countries, and that solidarity is lacking in Europe, and that is why we have, this, have had this crisis for the last 30 years. There's one more thing I want to ask to you to elaborate on, because you, there's, of course, the politicians, there's the border villages, there's the refugees, but then migration also has become like a huge industry, right? In what sense? For people of, of, uh, who work at Frontex, for instance, there's a lot of money to be made also oh, yeah. in yeah, migration. There, you could say there, you know, if you're an organization like Frontex, you have a certain interest in this, this idea of Europe as being invaded. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the maps Frontex produces, just go to the website, you see these huge red arrows pointing to Europe. So it creates, again, this image of the whole world is coming to Europe. Those, those maps are not innocent. They, they, and, but unfortunately, also the UN uh, refugee organization is exaggerating the increase in migration. Mm -hmm. Because they have been adding numbers to figures they wouldn't add in the past, particularly people displaced within countries. So you'd see the graph totally getting out of control. And when UNHCR is putting another press statement out, oh, the number of refugees is higher than ever. It was only 20 million 10 years ago. It's now 120 million. I don't think they do themselves a service. No. They think they're going to attract funding. But I think you reinforce this image of, oh my goodness, it's simply too many people. And then you, for, you feed that beast, there's political narratives that say, we can no longer deal with it. We have to push them back. It's really depressing that everyone working in it gains from a false narrative. Yeah. And that, that I think, needs to be uh, broken. And so we need a lot of smart journalists <laughs> and, uh, and a new generation of, of courageous politicians. Because opinion polls actually don't show that more and more people turn against immigration. Most of good opinion research shows that people have quite nuanced uh, opinions about migration. Mm -hmm. People may be worried about things happening for good reasons. If you watch a movie like this or if migrants are getting exploited in the labor market. Uh, there's a lot of suffering going on. There's also some problems in some neighborhoods with big concentration of migrants without many prospects. Segregation is real. But most people also understand that migrants do useful work that other people wouldn't do and that refugees deserve safety. The large majority of people supports that. Another encouraging fact is that in countries and regions where people have experiences with migrants, the opinion actually becomes more moderate and positive rather than negative. That's so it's particularly if you don't know migrants and you only see or you listen to politicians or you watch images of boats, you get this idea of Europe being besieged. Mm -hmm. But if you actually live with them, your opinion changes. Yeah. Yeah. That is hopeful. I'm happy that you bring this into yeah, it's not all a very quite long. depressing <laughs> conversation. <laughs> I'm going to see if there's anyone who wants to ask something in the audience. Yes, I think I will need to borrow this from you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm coming all the way towards you, but I think I'm gonna go because there's less people here. Thank you very much. Yes, come fast. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I wanted to ask what's your kind of opinion and stance on the semantics that are surrounding migration? Because for example, I had friends that literally stopped me from saying, oh, I'm an immigrant. They literally told me, you're an expat. That's such a big difference for them. And it made me laugh. It genuinely made me laugh. So I'm just wondering what is kind of like this PR war, I would call it, around this. And what's, what are your opinions on, on this kind of like language surrounding immigration? Is that to me? Yes. Uh, well, that's a huge question, eh? Um, well, it's definitely true. I mean, the expat example is a good one. And most of my, many of my students wouldn't see themselves as migrants initially, and think you're just a privileged bunch of students because, of course, you're a migrant. But it's it's become a class thing now. So if if you're, like, said, lower class, and particularly if you're non-European, then you're a migrant. <laughs> Uh, but if you're well off and earning a lot of money, you're an expat, right? 
And it reminds me of this irony of some of these videos that Europe is uh, financing, produced by the International Organization for Migration, that they sort of air in countries like Senegal or Morocco or Guatemala or Turkey, that basically say, don't go, Europe is dangerous, you should stay home. And then they have a local artist singing that song who, him or herself, probably has a nice villa somewhere in France, you know. But that's an expat telling his fellow men, fellow countrymen, you shouldn't go to Europe because it's so dangerous to cross a border. How condescending can it become? that we talk in this way about other people. Because what people don't realize if they say, well, those people shouldn't be coming, is that they're themselves migrants often. Often it's migrants themselves who tell poor people not to migrate because you shouldn't be moving. So it's, it, it is really problematic. And I think if you talk at immigration policy, yeah, the, 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 in the past there were these whites-only type of immigration policies in like North America, New Zealand, Australia, we no longer have that. So if you're like, let's say, an engineer from India, you're very welcome to. So it's become a class thing. It's really about non-elite people from non-European countries who get disproportionately targeted and get receive those labels, you know, you're the undesired migrant. And one thing we didn't talk about really, because of course this, this, this is predominantly about refugees, that non-refugees crossing borders are often also people, you know, we brand them like, you know, economic <coughs> refugees or, you know, migrants, like you say, and they get this negative image. But it, complete denial in Europe that so many undocumented migrants are being exploited at labor markets and governments don't do much about it. And last summer I was in Senegal and Morocco and you talk to young people there, they all know this work. Once you make it to Spain and you, you, you start working in a greenhouse, you're very welcome. You're going to be exploited, but you still earn five to ten times more than you could do back home. And that keeps that migration going. So I think Europe is totally stuck, has been stuck for 30 years in those, yeah, I linked to those narratives. That just, um, and the asylum seeker now has become this general, generic term of of the, these people we don't want, right? And we no longer dare to use plain racist language, but I think under that asylum seeker label, there's a lot of racial prejudice going on. Because that's predominantly about non-white people, Muslims, etc. Maybe there's room for, yes, I'm coming towards you. <laughs> Yeah, I was um, wondering, because you use a lot of data and, uh, and stats to kind of prove like a lot of um, misconceptions about things happening. And I was wondering, do you also like include like grassroots based data? Because here in the Netherlands, you notice like there's a lot of data literally here and everyone is trying to grasp the data. But yet again, they don't acknowledge it because it's like not scientific. So how do you, um, someone who does know that data is very valuable and important to move the narrative. How do you navigate in that space knowing that there's a lot of factual data not being used yet? Yeah, I think much more of that kind of work needs to be done. I mean, what I find, besides my, let's say, statistical work, very, uh, very important is going to places and going to borders and talking to people who want to cross borders and talking to border guards, because that's where, where I learn most, actually, to understand the data, to understand what's happening. But I think much more work can be done to, in, in a way, uncover you know, knowledge, uh, grassroots knowledge, grassroots narratives, and also but it's very important also addressing the earlier question, how do we change it? I think facts are not enough. We need new stories, we need new ways to talk about migration because we are storytellers. People don't understand things, if, don't would remember things if it's not wrapped into a story. And there I think is a big task. How do you address if people have fears about immigration, how do you respond to that? And, and that is tricky, but I think by connecting let's say, of embedding facts into stories that connect to real experiences of people, I think it becomes much more powerful. I don't know whether that's a good answer, perhaps you can talk about it later, but I think much more work needs to be done. We need to use both data and stories, and I think that is, and a diverse set of stories, and it's one of the things I liked about the movie, because it showed actually different perspectives of different actors, and they didn't necessarily put the border guard in the bad actor, but also kind of way showed that those border guards themselves were a bit victims of the system. And I like that you overcome those dichotomies because that's the polarization that is so harmful. 
So for instance, this pro anti frame, you know, that is so harmful because how could you be in favor against migration? It's like being against or in favor of the economy or the weather. I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> so that already shows it's the frame that's the problem and, and connected to personal experiences from different angles without sort of succumbing to a simplistic, it's fantastic or it's all bad sort of thing. I think that's really what we need. And yeah, a variety of stories coming up from the grassroots, I think that's an excellent approach. Uh, hello. I have another question for uh, Professor Heindhaas. Um, so you talked a lot about um, sharing responsibility um, when it comes to the migration, well, the, the, the this topic. Um, would you say that the uh, European Migration Pact, that is, I think it's going to take place in 2026, uh, would you say that it's a good attempt at sharing the responsibility or should it be improved in some way? And if so, in what way? Thank you. Well, I think as long as European nations keep on talking, that's a good thing. That's, what I, that's how I see the value of the... I think migration pact is a bit of a misnomer. It's an asylum pact. Uh, but I think it's bound to fail, the, the current pact, because the, the pact that is to be introduced in 2026 is based on this presumption you can seal off the outer border of Europe and there you can let's more or less filter people in terms of are they likely to get asylum or not and then the idea is that people who have a low chance get basically locked up in prison like camps on the European border but the whole assumption is that you can control the total external border and that is a complete illusion so I think in that sense it's bound to fill, but I think it's on the other hand a good, uh, good thing. So I don't want to be totally negative. I think it's, it is a good thing as long as we talk about a common approach. And there have been also some step. We have made some step forwards in the past as well. It's not only bad. So again, we also have to be careful not to go into a doom and gloom scenario. But I think the biggest risk, what I see in Europe, is that central centrist parties are taking over the narratives of the extreme right. So I yeah. don't hear many refreshing stories <laughs> coming from the center or the left at that moment. So I think that is, that is a big problem. But yeah, it's still good to be talking. I mean, if that wouldn't happen, it, it, um, yeah, we would be in a much worse situation. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Jolie, maybe a last question for you. Mm -hmm. What is next for you? Are you also already working on a new project? Well, I just finished shooting uh, a movie, uh, you know, I with who? <laughs> but it's, it's nice technically also. technically confidential, guys, <laughs> and I'm on camera, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, after uh, The Green Border, I shot three movies. Um, and there are two coming out next, one uh, who is quite political and another one less and uh, the one who's political was shot in uh, Gabon in Africa and is uh, um, a story but also a reality about <laughs> the Dr. Mukwege who's a Congolese doctor who has studied in France but then went back to Congo to uh, repair a uh, the female bodies, at least that's how the book is called, mm -hmm. but he does it literally because he's a doctor. And um, because there's a whole genocide going on there where um, women, and when I'm talking about women, we can go from one year old until yeah, the age a woman can be, uh, who are being raped, uh, sadly. And, um, and so he goes there and tries to uh, handle the situation with the power he has and that's through his hands being a doctor and he does that with another doctor called Guy Bernard Cadier who's a Belgian doctor and who helps him with that and so that's also a quite harsh movie that that'll be on your screens really soon <laughs> and uh, and so the other movie is me just being a young girl <laughs> uh, but also a really good movie and so yeah for the rest I'm just um, 
I'm looking forward to what's next and uh, hoping that I'll be able to tell uh, stories and represent stories like this one mm -hmm. who can raise awareness and and make people have some empathy uh, for each other human beings because sometimes we forget that at the end of the day when we're all naked we are all human beings and that we should care for each other and have just a little bit more empathy and try to put ourselves in uh, someone else's boots just to try to understand their situation and and yeah accept the situation because we cannot deny it we cannot ex ex uh, es whoa. escape it it's here we have to face it and um yeah movies like the green border uh, are movies that just raises awareness and I think that when you see such a movie you can just like it's right in front of you and so yeah you can't escape that either yeah you no. can't escape that um, either I love it how you are working on the stories that Hein says we need not only in politics but also as humans yeah Thank you both very Thank much for you. being here. Hopefully, if you have another question, we'll be at the bar. Hopefully, see you there. And thank you. Wait. Yes. Oh. <laughs> it's not really a question. <laughs> I wanted to thank you very much as a, from the uh, bottom of the heart of Foundation Polish Culture in the Netherlands. We try to keep the conversation going. We try to build the bridges. And lead, let's keep the conversation tomorrow. Last tickets yes. are still available. More conversations to come mm -hmm. tomorrow. Thank you very Please much. Please come tomorrow. Mm -hmm.